computer. So today is 28th of February, 2024. We will cover sleep and digits and confidence level here in this, for the labs. And going back here. Okay, at this point in time, you must have, uh, you must fill out all your units. You know, should look like some, some like, somewhat like that. Votes. Meter and meter. Here, the X average will have units of meters. The V average will also have units of voltage. I already gave that to you. And then the confidence, uh, here you go, the, the standard deviation. When you do dimensional analysis, okay, for, first you have to know what is the equation for the standard deviation, right? Once you know the equation for the standard deviation is, you can do dimensional analysis to find out what is the unit for the standard deviation. Okay? So in order to calculate the standard deviation, you have to square the measurement minus the average of the measurement square and then sum with all that stuff and take the square root. When you do that for the average, for the positions, right? The position, the x coordinate you get the unit of meter, okay? You get the unit of meter. And for this specific one, you should just type meter. M, right? I abbreviate by the letter M. Do not spell out meter. I'm gonna correct with respect to this M here. The sigma X, you know, is the standard deviation from the mean. Standard deviation from the mean, and it has a similar equation. It's slightly different from the standard deviation. Okay, the standard deviation from the mean is going to be sigma, this equation here that you have, divided by square root of n. Since sigma has units of meter, the standard deviation from the mean is also going to have units of meter. And the last one in that table, this one here, sigma x over x average, it, it has a very important uh, interpretation, okay? That's why I put this one here. This one upstairs, the sigma x has unit of meter, the unit of uh, the, the one downstairs, which is the unit of the average value of the position of the coordinate x, right, also has units of meter. So when you divide meter by meter, you get a unit less unit. That is the number one. So what do you do in your spreadsheet? You know, you put here, you've got to put meter, here you put one, okay? I'm, I'm showing that for this one alone, okay? Like the, the other ones are going to, you, you have to figure out on your, on your own. At this point in time, you already plotted a graph, right? You plotted two graphs, one for the, you know, let's see if I can get that, everything at once. Insert, uh, oh gosh, insert, uh, this one here? Yeah, here you go. No, that's not how it goes. Okay, it has to be like that. Yeah, it has to be like that. And then we have to add, right? Just like we did. Ah, and uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because uh, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult for me to figure out what's written here, right? But uh, at this point in time, you already have the graph one, which is the equipotentials. And you have to plot this graph, this other graph here. Right? And then you you got your, uh, see, everything in Russian, right? I don't know, I cannot. You gotta get your regression equation plus the R square. Once you get the regression equation, you know, you type it here. When you get your R square, you type it here. Okay, R square has no units at all ever, so you don't have to worry. The number of data points is going to be five, one, two, three, four, five. For this one is going to be five. 
everyone, you know, each group is going to have a different uh, regression equation, a different R square. Okay. And the slope of the equation you type here, you type right here, the numerical value of the slope you type here. I remember that mine was like 50.08, right? Something like that. And then you have to put the units as well. Numeric value unit here. Oops, 50.08, right? That was mine, right? Yours is gonna be different. Then you the E field is going to be is going to coincide with the slope because the E field is the slope of the graph V versus X. Okay. That what we end. Let's see if I can get the regression equation here. Uh, here, no. Well, let's see. So let's say, let, let us play, let, you know, with fake numbers, okay? In my case, let's say my R square was nine. I'm gonna need the R square to, to come up with the, with the other CL here, CL confidence level, okay? Nine, uh, Nine eight seven. Let's say, let's say, okay. Just for the sake of uh, of example. Okay. And so more students coming. Let's see. Jacqueline, good. And then what you have to do, you have to get that, uh, you have to get the confidence level. Okay, going back here. Let's see, let's do the... Um, Let's do the significant digits first, and then we do the confidence level. Uh, confidence level later afterwards. Confidence level afterwards. Okay. Let's do the significant digits first. I always do the I, I like all, I like to do the confidence level at the end because it's the more difficult of all. Okay, so let's uh, let's concentrate on the significant digits, significant figures. Not this one, this one right here. Okay. So in order to, to get the significant digits, you have to use one of the tables that I have. But wait a minute. In order to get the significant digits for the X and Y, that's easy, okay? X and Y, that's gonna be easier, okay? Here you go. All those three, all those one, all those one, two, three, four, five, five sets of data. This one is gonna be easier for X and Y, and then we have to worry about the votes. Okay. So in order to get the right number of significant digits, significant digits or figures, right? Digits, figures for the X and Y coordinates, coordinates, you have to know. You have to know the instrument that you used to make these measurements, right? And if you remember, the instrument that we used for those measurements, for those measurements, I mentioned that the X and Y coordinates were measured with a ruler, okay? So, so to find the significant digits, one, find the significant digits, several steps. One, 
you have to know the instrument, six conditions of x and y coordinates, right? Of x and y coordinates. You have to know the instrument you used to measure them. In this case, it was the ruler. Second step, you have to know the resolution of your instrument, right? Of the instrument you used. Of the instrument you used. In the case of the ruler, the resolution is going to be 0 0.001 meters. Should be, let's go better here. One millimeter, which is equal to 0.1 centimeter, which by the way is equal to 0 0.001 meter. Everything here should be written down in terms of meters, okay? Don't forget, everything should be written down in terms of meters. Once you know the resolution of the instrument, right? You display, you must display your measurements in terms of this resolution. Okay. So if you have, uh, for instance, example, I'm going to put an example here, example. If you have an exact measurement of uh, of let's say one centimeter, right? The right way to display this measurement with the right number of significant figures would be point, 1.0 point centimeters, which must be converted to meters, right? 0 0.010 0 .0 meters. That's how you do it, okay? Keep in mind that in this course, I'm using the conservative way of reporting the significant figures. You must have, it's possible that you must have learned it differently from another professor, right? But let's use the, the most conservative way that says that we, we stop at the resolution of the instrument. Some professors teach that you can go one more decimal place here for the ruler, okay? But it, it's not incorrect, incorrect what the other professor said, but it's also it's not so it's not incorrect what I what I say here I, either. In those cases, we you know we can use our judgment. Okay, and the judgment that we apply it here, that we apply here is for the case in which we're using a more conservative way of uh, displaying the significant digits, right? So once you find that out, now what you have to do for next step, report the right number of sig figs in Excel using the numeric format, right? Numeric format. So here you go. Right now, all, all those numbers are being reported in terms of the scientific format. And I am afraid that, let's see if I can get that, uh, gosh. Uh, format, format, format. Is that the one here, format? No, that's not the one. So here you go. Which, what, what format number is in the Excel? Can you tell me, can you help me out here? It's just a matter of the order here. One, two, three, let's see. I don't think that's the one. No, that's not the one. This one is cutting. Let's see, I, well, not this one. Let's see, must be somewhere around here. No, it's not this one. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Wow, let's take time, huh? Nope, not this one. Must be somewhere around here. So for those who just joined us, okay, I my, my 
my Microsoft uh, application documents just uh, start talking in Russian with me, you know? And now I, I cannot convert it back to English. If you know how to do that, please let me know. Okay, so let's go one by one. So let's see here. One student by one student. Let's see if you're, let's see, Jacqueline is here. Jacqueline just joined us, right? Hello, Jacqueline. Okay, good. So can you, were you able to format your data there, Jacqueline? I want you, we're starting to work with the X and Y coordinates here. I want you to format, right now it's formatted as a scientific format, right? You want to format it in numeric format. Were you able to do that, Jacqueline? Not this one. I cannot show to you because all oh, those things, let's see, no. My format says in the fifth one. Okay, format says one up. Okay, good, thank you. One, two, three, four, five, must be this one, right? Let's see, no, no, that's not my case. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, maybe it's this one, the fourth one, nope. One, two, three, four, five, maybe it's this one. Oh yeah, that's the one. Okay, and now you have to have to help me out. Let's see, which one is the number one? Is the numeric one? Is first, second, third, fourth? Jacqueline, which one is that, that gonna be? Okay, must be this one here. No, no, that, that's not this one. It's this one here. No, no, no. That's 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 that's, that's the dollar sign. Okay, must be this one. No, it's not this one. Is this one here? No, that's date. Uh, the second one, let's see, is that the, oh yeah, that's the second one, thank you. Okay, that's the numeric. Okay, it's working, huh? it's starting to work. And then what you have to do, you have to add three decimal places, okay? Three decimal places, and now you have all your measurement, your measurement here in, in with the proper format, okay? So we're going to do for all X and Y, all together. You can do for everything in a single shot, okay? In a single shot. Okay, you can go X and Y, X and Y, X and Y, and then the format, let's see, which one is this one here? Yeah, that's the one, is the second one, put three decimal places, okay? We are converting from, converting from scientific format to numeric format, right? And then displaying all the measurements with the right number of significant digits. Okay, so confidence level. Uh, next step, report the right number of sequences using the numeric format. Uh, no? So, convert. Wait, yeah? Someone was, was talking here? Do you want to say anything, Vanessa? No? Okay. Okay, convert uh, the, the numbers from scientific format to numeric format. And display them in with three decimal places. We are doing that just for the X and Y coordinates, okay? Report the right number sequence figures. Excel using the form, my format, okay? X and Y coordinates only. That applies to X and Y coordinates only, okay? Why am I converting from scientific format to numeric format? Well, because it's easier to read it in numeric format, okay? That's why. It's easier to see what it means, okay? And there's a very good rule of thumb that I'd like to apply, okay? You convert the number, good rule of thumb to apply for conversions. Good rule of thumb for conversion from scientific format to numeric format. 
Okay. You make this conversion. This conversion on when the number is greater, uh, let's see, on the magnitude of the number, right? On the magnitude. Magnitude of the number is greater than 0 0.001, right? If the number is less than 0 0.001, uh, greater or equal, let's put this way, or equal than. If the number is less than, then you report the measurement in scientific format. So that's the, that's a very good rule of sum. The number is less than 0 0.001, then you report the measurement in scientific format, okay? But don't forget to report it with the right number, huh? With the right number of sequence digits, right? Right number of six phase. Let's use this, this rule of thumb. All the numbers that you're reporting here are more than 1,000. All the numbers here are more than 1,000. So you report them in numeric format. Now we have to worry about the numeric vo values e of the voltage, okay? We have to report it with the right number of significant digits, okay? Right number of significant digits. Um, and in order to do that, you have to go to that table that I posted in in Canvas. Let's go there. Canvas. Remember. Okay, I have messages. Let's see, courses. Uh, and this one right here. And lectures, confidence level. Okay, that's the one, six feet. See that? You have to download this table and you will be using this table for the rest of the semester, okay? To report it with the right number of six feet. Let's see if I can download it. If you were if you are measuring, you know, if you're doing the experiments there in your in the actual lab, you you'd be using the multimeter, right? Let's see, can I can I download it? So odd. I can't seem to huh. have you been able have you been able to download that your hard drive? Let's see. There might be a way to download it. Uh, decrease, increase, no, strange, huh? Copy to, so odd. They don't let us download it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter. Uh, so what you're going to do, if you are working with your, like, like, like my multimeter here, right? You know, my multimeter here. If you are working with your multimeter, whatever voltage you read here from the multimeter, it is how you display in your spreadsheet. Okay? Let's see if I can give you an example. I'm gonna get a battery here. I'm gonna then I need to hold it tight. Uh, but I need more than one hand here. Let's see. I'm going to stop sharing. Remind me to, to, you know, remind me to share the screen again, okay? Right now I have to switch back, stop sharing. And then if I forget to 
share the screen. Remind me, please. Here you go. I want you to see the measurement that we're gonna make here in this with this. Whoops. I need more than one hand here. Uh, maybe there's a better way of doing that. Let's see if I can put it that way. Yeah, let me see if I can display that for you. I'm going to need to use a tape here. Oh, just my finger here. Let's see. I'm I'm getting those probes here fixed with my with my tape, so I can show what is being measured here in the screen of my multimeter. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? Let's see. Uh oh. Let's see this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 1.538. See that? That's the measurement of uh, that this multimeter is making. Of the battery that I have here. So what do you do if if you are if you had to report the voltage of the battery you had to report all those numbers that are showing here in this multimeter and it's very stable you can see it is very stable 1.538 okay in the case of uh, of the voltages of the spreadsheet you know you find the number of significant figures right here in this table that I prepared for that you don't want to Use resistance, the resistance table. No, not this one. This one is the, the voltage of the power supply. That's not the one you want to use it. You want to use this table here. Voltage of the DMM. DMM stands for digital multimeter. Okay. And I'm going to see, and I have all the SIP conditions here. If the voltage, you know, all, all this table here was taken from the multimeter that we use there at the Lay Harbor, okay? If the voltage is, you know, is between these two values, the very small voltage value, it's going to have only one significant digit. If the voltage is between those two values, it's going to have two significant digits and so on, okay? Let's get that here. I'm going to, okay, and, and I'm gonna display those two tables simultaneously. Uh, what's going on here? Ah, interesting. Yeah, it doesn't look like I can do that. Let's see. Oh, huh. Ah, so odd. Okay. For some reason, it doesn't have a it's sliding. Uh oh, too much. Okay, now it's just just good. 
just right, okay? So here you go. Let's take a look here at my first cell. My first cell, you know, I got exactly a value of one, one volt, okay? So we have to look here in this table, how many signals you can figure that I have to report for this measurement of one volt. We can see that between one and 1.9999, 1 you're supposed to display five significant digits, okay? So for this specific measurement, it has to be, you know, five significant digits with, what does it mean? It means that we must have four decimal places there, okay? So since this number is greater than 1,000, we have to convert it to numeric format. Should be this one? No. Let's try it again. And I'm going to convert everyone here. Uh, format, format, this one here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> I forgot it. Here you go. Now I'm sharing the screen. Now help me out, uh, let's see, someone there told me, let's see, fifth one up, right, starting from the bottom of the two options. Okay, thank you. Let's see, fifth, one, two, three, four, five. I believe it's this one, right? Yeah, that's the one. So I'm converting that to numeric format. And I'm since we must have five significant digits, the numbers must have four decimal places, right? Let's, let's make sure that's the right one. We, we uh, okay, yeah. This one is zero, that's odd. Okay, there must be a mistake right here. This is not supposed to be zero. This one's supposed to be one. Looks like I erased it accidentally. Okay. Okay, any number equal to one and above it should have five significant digits. Now, let's take a look. Now, this measurement here was not exactly one, just below one, right? Below one. And look at my table. Numbers between 0.2 and 0.9999 must have five significant digits. So this measurement here must have five decimal places. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. This one here five decimal places, and then we have it, okay? We have the right number of different digits for votes. What about for, for one vote? What about for three votes? You gotta do the same thing, right? Here you go. Uh, three votes is between two and 9.99. Consequently, it's gonna have four significant digits. Four significant digits should be three decimal places, Three decimal places right in here, okay? Four significant digits, three decimal places. And let's see, five, right? Now five is between, oh, four decimal, uh, three decimal places as well. Right? What about seven? Yeah, three decimal places as well. And you, anything between two and nine, two and almost 10, right? He's going to have three decimal places. Here you go, one, two, three, right? And this one here, let's see. Yeah, he's gonna have three decimal places as well. One, two, three, okay? So that's the right number of sequence digits for my voltage and for my coordinates X and Y. Remember, I'm doing that just for this lab, right? And then you have to apply all this knowledge for the other upcoming labs. And then you have to worry about sequence digits of those two here, right? The, the, the difference here is that gonna be X average and V average. You cannot, you don't have to use the table. You, you cannot use the table. You have to, to figure out what happens to the significant digit when we take the average, right? We use that rule that was taught in physics, in physics six. 
And the way I like to do that with my students, I do the following. Look, in order to figure out easily how many sequence digits goes here, what do I do? I, I first, you know, determine the sum of all those values. And why, why didn't sum? Oh, gosh, I know why. Okay. The summation must be in, in Cyrillic, Cyrillic as well. Okay, I cannot do that. I cannot do that, but you can do that, okay? You can do that on your side. You type sum, open parentheses, and drag all those values here. You get something like that. Okay? And what you're going to get, you're going to get a number that's going to be something like that. One point, one, two, three, four. Oops. One, two, three, four. Okay? That's, that's no places. One, two, three, four. Because that's the rule for summation, right? You we keep the least precise decimal place. Okay? So you're going to get a summation. It's going to be around one, two, three, four, five, six, six, right? And then you apply the significant digit for the sum, the rule of significant digits for the sum. So you stop at the fourth decimal place of the voltage. Okay. And then you count the number of significant digits. Four decimal places plus this number. So you're going to have five significant digits. So for the voltage average, you're going to have five significant digits here. We're going to put it one, two, three, four, five. Four significant, five significant digits should be four decimal places. Okay? For this value. Let's do for this one. This one is the same thing, right? You sum, but then there is something interesting here, right? It's three three volts, right? When you sum all those values here, what you're going to get? You're going to get two digits greater than 10, three, six, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is 18. You're going to get 18, whatever, right? Dot, one, two, three, okay? One, two, one, two, three, right? And then we have the rule for the summation. When you sum those numbers, you end up gaining a significant digit because the number exceeds 10. Here, the number doesn't exceed 10. So you do not gain a significant digit. You do not gain a significant digit, but here you do gain. You know, you do add a significant digit because of the rule of summation. And then this one is going to have five significant digits or four. Don't, don't forget the summation must be divided, must you be divided, right, by the number of one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to have five significant digits, four decimal places. Four decimal places. Here you go. One, two, three, four. Yeah, same number of sequence digits as the other one. You do the same thing here for this one, right? You're going to get one, two, one, two, three. Same here, one, two, one, two, three. Seven times six is 42, so it doesn't, it doesn't go above 100. This one here is going to be 9 times 648. It still doesn't go above 100. Okay. And all of them are going to have the same number of decimal places. Here you go. 1, 2, 3. And I got to change. No, wait a minute. No, it's going to be 4. Sorry. Four because we have to divide, right? We still have to divide. Uh, four. One more. For the small places, four, five significant digits. Okay? That's what you do. You don't have to worry about significant digits here. Whatever is written in red, you know, you don't you don't worry about the number of significant digits. It would be too much work to 
to calculate that because the formula is complicated. That's why I you're not required to, to find the significant digits for those values here, okay? Quantities in red, bold face, do not require significant digits, okay? Those quantities, you don't need to worry about significant digits. Those two are easier to do, right? So now we gotta do for X, right? We gotta do for X. Do the summation. What's gonna be the summation? X, one, two, three, right? And then, uh, how, how we gotta sum those values. Uh, let's see. Let's see. There is a way of doing that. This one plus this one without having to use Cyrillic, right? Yeah, okay, good. It's going to take a long time, but uh, at least we can get the numeric value. Good. So I got it. 0 0.089. I'm going to center justify. You can see that the number does not exceed 0.1. So since we have only two significant digits here, the average value of X is going to be reported as two significant digits as well. Two significant digits mean three decimal places in the numeric format. Two significant digits mean three decimal places in numeric format. And we, oh, wait a minute. And, well, for this one, for this, right? For those two, for those three. Now, now let's see if we, we have the same uh, for the other ones. Let's see here. Oh, this one exceeds 0.1. See that? This one does exceed 0.1. So because of that, this value here, this average here, must he be reported with three decimal places. No, three significant digits or four decimal places. Okay? See that? One, two, three. The moment you sum out those numbers, you exceed 0.1. When you exceed 0.1, you gain one significant digit. And I can do that for this one. I can do for this one. I can do that for this one. Okay? Here too. Okay, this one too, we gained one significant digit. We gained one, uh, we didn't gain one significant digit. Okay, because it didn't exceed one, but here we gain one significant digit. So here should be, you know, three decimal places. Those two should be three decimal. This one should be four decimal places. Four decimal places. Okay, this one, did we gain a significant digit here? No, so we are displaying correctly. Here we gain one significant digit. So you gotta put four decimal places. The number of significant digits is going to depend on the value of the summation, okay? That's a really good rule of thumb to get the right number of significant digits. The values that you're gonna have there in your spreadsheet most likely is gonna be different. Okay. Three decimal places. Uh, let's see. Three decimal places, three significant digits. Okay, good. Three decimal places, three significant digits. Here should be three significant digits. Here should be three significant digits. Here should be four significant digits. Okay, very good shape. Everything else, you know, you can, uh, you might want to, you know, you may want to display it in numeric format because it's easier to read, right? Only those numbers that are greater than 1,000. So here you go. Uh, let's see here. This one here. Yeah. You don't have to worry. Eh? This one you live in scientific format, those numbers, let's see, we can get up those numbers. 
we display a, a numeric format. You, like I said, you don't have to worry about the number of sequence digits for those three columns, right? Those ones, we go numeric, one, two, three. And whatever is less than 1,000, you, you keep, oops, what's going on here? You keep it in, uh, okay, I didn't change the format. Change to numeric format. Okay, now we have it. Those two, you can leave this one, do it, okay? So we're done with significant digits. Okay. To find, here you go, to find the number of significant digits for the voltage, for the voltages, comma, you use the table provided in class, what's the name? They were provided in class P07 sigfig dot PDF. Oops. Ah, that's terrible. Let's see. Now I gotta adjust. Ali B. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and which you eleven? Okay, okay. Use this table for voltages for voltage values. Okay, here you go one for voltage values of the DMM. You use the third table, right? Third table. Let's make sure it's third table. Voltage one, two, three. Yeah, that's right. There's more. For there are four tables here, right? For you know, I'm not putting order here. For resistance values of the EMM, you use the first table. For voltage values of the power supply, you use the first table. For the voltage, for voltage values of the DMM, you use the third table. And then for current, not, not values, but let's say measurements, right? Measurements would be a, a better word. You use the force table. Force table. Okay. That's how you're going to use this table that you see right in here. All this table was taken out from the multimeters that we have there at the, at the college. We still didn't make any measurements of resistance yet. I still didn't introduce you to the measurement of resistance or the quantity of resistance. But I did tell you about the, volt the voltage, right? And I'm going to tell you very soon about the current. Not today, but next class, definitely. Next class, when we start talking about electric circuits. So one more thing. Right? So what we did so far. Okay. Adjust, we adjust the CPN digits on the tables. And now we're going to look at the confidence level. We're going to look at the confidence level. If you took the course with me, physics six with me, you already know how to find the confidence level. If you didn't take physics six with me, you should do not know how to find the confidence level. Okay. 
Let me ask one question. Were you folks able to download the this document there in Canvas? I, I can seem to find a way to download here from here. Let me ask you one by one, right? So let's see. Jacqueline is here, right? Yorgo, are you there, Yorgo? I don't know. Right under the title, let's see. Right under the title. Uh, show me where, I don't see it here, your, uh, Paul. Professor, go a little up and it says download P076 big. Uh, but I cannot go up. I cannot go up. No, 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 like, um, like on just go a little further up. Not, not on the page itself. Like so. Ah, okay. If, go to home, right? Like that. Go back. Uh, to. Is that is it this way? No, no, no. So go back to it. So uh, open that back up. To the document. Okay. Okay. So you see where it says P zero seven sig fig PDF. Yes. That under that. Under ah, gotcha. <laughs> right on my nose. <laughs> Right on my nose. Thank you, thank you. I have uh, I have this this cousin of mine that used to say, "Well, we don't see things that are below the horizon," which is true, right? But and you and we also don't see things that are just below our our nose. It's difficult to see things that are below the horizon and difficult to see things that are below our nose. Because the nose is in the way, right? This one was below my nose. <laughs> Not quite it, but, but here you go. Good. So download it, right? And we have, uh, and then we can get the other one too. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, the other one is the confidence level. Uh, let's see, 957. Let's take a break. Let me take attendance first, right? And then when you come back to the from the break, I show you how to do the confidence level. We need a little break here. So Yorgo is not here today, right? Lizelle, are you there? Nope. Paul Zapata, just talk to me, right? Paul, just yes, talk to me. Thank you. Vanessa Escalera. Vanessa Escalera is not here. Norberto Lopez. Norberto Lopez. Norberto Lopez is here. Hi, Norberto. Okay, thank you. Next, Vanessa Mena. She's here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sky. Here. Thank you. Ashley Izumo. I see. Meta. Izumo is not here. Corina Horado is here, right? Here. Thank you. Six. And then who joined us? Just Lizelle. Hi, Lizelle. So let's see, I'll, I'll copy that. And then how do I paste it? Paste it here, right? Oops. Insert, yeah. Mm -hmm. I am struggling a little bit. Well, for those who just arrived, I'm struggling a little bit here because my Microsoft applications are talking to me only in Russian. And I've got to fix that. Okay, Lizelle, so here you go. I'm gonna give you attendance. Okay. Okay, this first one here applies to lab one. This one here I'll, I'll consider lab two, okay? And so here you go. Let's see, lab one, I'm gonna put that lab one. And Okay. Any questions from any of you? Did you 
Okay, so uh, 9.59, we're going to have our break soon. Okay, so we did that. I just the figures of the tables. And when we come back from the break, we talk about the confidence level. And black, yeah, black, that's good. Break from 10 a.m. To 10 15 a.m. Okay, so I see you in 15 minutes. Okay, so I'm back here and we are recording. Let's share the screen. Okay. <clears throat> and now we are going to to talk about this confidence level, right? Confidence level. Once we're done this confidence level, we can start the second lab, confidence level. Okay, get the table, get the confidence level table. This confidence level table is something you're not gonna find anywhere. You're going to find a confidence level table in the internet, okay? But not like the one that I have here. The one that I have here is much more detailed one than you're going to find out there. Okay, so here you go. I'm sharing the confidence level table for you. And, you know, let me tell you, confidence level is the confidence level, confidence level CL, okay? CL. CL is a measure of how close your regression equation. Regression equation is the mathematical model, okay? Mathematical model of your experiment. How close your regression equation is to the data points that you have in your graph, okay? There is, you know, there are confidence level, that is, uh, I'm not gonna write it down, okay? So let's leave it this way. Okay, so if you, in an ideal world, okay, the CL would always be, would always be equal to one, exactly. But that's an ideal world. We don't live in an ideal world, okay? And equal to one means or 100%, okay? 100%, so if you get a CL equal to one, it means that your regression equation fits exactly your data points. That's what it means. But we don't live in an ideal world, okay? Because we don't live, because we don't, Left in an ideal world, comma, the CL will always be between zero and one. Okay. Zero means zero percent. Uh, Uh, 
zero uh, percent close to your data points, right? In our experiment that we do here, we really get CLs that are pretty high on the other order, at least 99%. I have notes in that, at least 99%, okay? And in order to find out the CL, you must use this table right in here, okay? In order, in order to find the CL, you must use the provided table. Remember? And there's more. Continue? No? Okay, so there is one more thing. The CL is a function of two parameters. Is a function of N, the number of data points, and is a function of the determination coefficient R square, okay? And you have both values there in your table. You can see it. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy equation, okay? I, I have seen, I've had a look at those equations. It's not an easy equation. That's why, you know, that's why I provide you with a table. I don't provide you with an equation. The equation is not easy to calculate. Microsoft Word has an equation that allows you to do that, but it's, you know, even for me, it's, it's kind of difficult type of uh, equation. It's kind of difficult function for this reason that I provide you with this table that you see right here, okay? So take a look. In this table here, the, the provided table, you know, the provided table list your CL value, top row, okay? The provided table, let's see. The provided table has, uh, it lists the following parameters, okay? And first uh, column, right? First column, right here, see that? First column, that's your value of data, pairs of data points. List is the alpha right here, the parameter alpha. The, the following parameter n alpha, right? Uh, first row TL, second row. And then I'm going to put one more here, degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom. Yeah, it is F, right? Oh, DF, okay, DF. Degrees of freedom, DF, second column, alpha, okay? Those are the parameters that your table lists. But you're interested only, you're going to be using only those two here. The N, the first column, and uh, the second row. Everything else is just uh, redundant, okay? Everything else is just redundant. Let me see if someone is trying to come in. Good, Norberto is back. Okay, so you can neglect those two here. There is a relationship between degrees of freedom and N, and there is a relationship between alpha and CL. There's a relationship between them, okay? And it's very easy to figure that out. Note, see that DF is N minus two, right? N minus two, N minus two, N minus two. 
And alpha is what? Alpha is one minus CL, right? Notice it. CL plus alpha is one, CL plus alpha is one, CL plus alpha is one, and so on. So all you have to do is to worry about only this row, right? And this column, that's all you have to worry about. Now, everything else here that's in this table is the R squared, okay? And I gotta write that down here. The provided table is the following parameters, one, First column, number of data points in your graph, two degrees of freedom, second column, which is, is BF equal to N minus two, three alpha, which is given by, you know, alpha, alpha is, one minus CL, and then for the CL, second row, confidence level, the confidence level. You have to worry only about those two right here. And there's one more, right? The rest of the table are the, there's a name for that, Take a look here. Critical values of R squared. The rest of the table, most of it, right? Most of the numerical, or most of the numerical values, most of the numerical values are they are different, uh, are the critical values of the determination coefficient. R squared, okay, like that. So if I were to picture this table, and I have done that before, let's see if I can get that for you. Uh, ay, 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 ay. Okay, so let's see, I'm going to, there is, there is one, let's see, I have a picture of that. I don't want to draw it again. Maybe it's here. Nope, not here. Let's see. it here. No. Maybe it's here. No. Okay, I'm going to illustrate that from scratch. It's going to take too long for me to find. Okay, so the table looks just like that. A generic way of portraying this table. It's like the following, you go. Okay, so here we have CL. All right. Start at point 95, goes to point 99, point 95%, right? 99%. 99.9% and so on. One, two, three. Okay. And then we have in the vertical. N, right? N with the, oh, one, two, three, lowercase N now. Uh, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc. Right? And then here, in the rest of the table. The rest of the table is no, that's not what I want. I want this one here. It's gonna be my R square. Everything else is most of the table is the determination coefficient R square. Is that super script? Let's see here. No, that's super, super script. Let's see, let's get that. Ay, 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 ay. Let's see, must be, oh, super script like that. Must be this one, I guess. I see. Yeah, okay, I got it. <laughs> Bold face, and I'm going to increase the size. Everything, can I increase more? 200, I'm going to, yeah, like that. Did you get the idea? Right, I'm gonna go a little bit higher here. Everything else, so for a given number of data points, and a given R square, you are capable of finding your CL using that table. That's the whole idea, okay? So we're gonna write it down here, your CL value. So for a non N, N value, and R square, you can find the CL, okay? You can find your CL. So let me, I'm gonna give you an example, example. Simple example, simple example, okay? Let N be equal to six. Okay, and uh, R is square. R is square equal to, are we recording here? Let's see. Yeah, we're recording, that's good. And R is square, a simple example, right? And equal to six, right in here in this row. Suppose that you perform the experiment and then it's not gonna happen. What, what this example is not a, it's not a real life example, okay? It's not a real life example, but it's a good way of understanding how this table works. Suppose that you perform an experiment with the six data points and you get exactly this value here. Something like that will never happen, okay? But suppose, suppose 99484.99484. Find CL, okay. So what's gonna be? Just look at the table. Six, nine, nine, eight, four, your CL is going to be this value that you have right in here, okay? According to the table, the CL, the table, CL is gonna be what? One minus 10 to, what that? 10 to the minus five. Okay. Okay, so which is a number very close to one, right? Is one minus point, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, which is point nine nine one two three one two three four five like that. 
Okay. It's very close to, to this to one. It's not exactly one. I'm going to give you another example. It's not a real life example. Simple example. Not a real life example. Example. It's not a real life example, but it's good enough for you to understand how this CL works. Okay. Another real life example. Uh, another example that's not real life. Sorry. And then, like I said, you know, suppose that uh, you got R squared exactly one. Okay. Note what's happening here in your table. I want you to pay very close attention to what's happening to your table. The closer the R square is to one, right? See that? R square is increasing from the left to the right for a given N value. R square is increasing from the left to the right. And the closer it is to one, the closer the CL becomes to one as well. See, one minus 10 to minus two, one minus 10 to minus three, one minus 10 to minus four, and so on, right? So very far away to the extreme right, you're going to have a CL equal to one, as well as R squared equal to one, okay? According to the trend, to the trend, right, of the table, we can see that CL for this R square value is going to be exactly one or 100%. Okay? And then we're going to go for another example that's not a real life example, but it's still very important because it gives you a feeling of how this function behaves. N equal to six. And now my R square is going to be exactly equal to zero. And because R squared that has no correlation whatsoever, because your regression equation has no correlation whatsoever with the data, the confidence level is going to be zero as well, 0%. Okay, let's take a look at the table. From the right to the left, you can see that this number gets closer and closer to zero, right? R square becomes zero at the very far left of the table. When R square becomes zero, CL also becomes zero at the far left. And alpha becomes one, okay? Those three different examples, we can come up with another, let's say, another not so real life example, this one here, right? N equal to 13, R squared equal to 0.64154. What will be the CL? CL, we're gonna be 0 0.999, 99.9%, .9%. okay? But in real life, we don't get that. In real life, you know, in real life, we don't get R squares that uh, R squared that point side, right? I square values that point side with their with the critical values, with the critical values in the table. We don't, okay, I'm gonna emphasize here, we don't. Instead, we get values that are between them, between them. Between them. Okay. So I'm gonna give you an example. That's why I come my, in my table. That's why in my table I tell you, look, what are the bounds, what are the minimum and maximum values of the CL, right? Is it not that there are minimum and maximum values? Actually, what's the lower bound of CL and what's the upper bound of CL, okay? That's what it means. And then suppose that we have this 
R square value, 9987 and equal to five. Okay, and equal to five, 9987. Okay, 9987 is a number between those two R square values. Okay, 9987. So we're gonna use this as a, an example. Simple example. Simpler example, closer to real life. Let n equal to five and r squared being 0.9987. Find CL. Okay. What are the bounds? Let's see, simpler curve. Find the bounds of CL. Okay. The lower and upper bounds, the lower and upper bounds of CL. Okay. So 9987, just like I said, is between those two values, right? I'm using my own my own R square here that I came up with. So go ahead, go to the table. 9987 is between those two values. And then what do we get? You get a CL value that anywhere between those two values. One minus 10 to minus four and one minus 10 to minus five, okay? Solution, CL must be one minus 10 to minus four and one minus 10 to minus five. Okay, make sense? Let's go, yeah, another one here. One, two, ego, minus four. And then this is going to be exactly what you input in your table right here. The minimum, the lower bound of CL, you're gonna be, you gotta, when you do that, you always type like that. You put equal sign one minus 10 to minus four, okay? If you don't put the equal sign, Excel is not gonna do the math for you. And the other one is gonna be equal one minus 10 to minus five, okay? Do you see that? 99.99%. 99.999%. So now you have to take a look at your data there. What's your R square? And then fill up the CL, okay? Fill up the CL using the table. Uh, let's see. Actually, we have, uh, we have six students, huh? Corina, Jacqueline. Jacqueline is here, right? Lisa is here. Paul Zapat is here. Vanessa Scaler is not here. Norberto, where is Norberto? Norberto is not here. Okay. And with a star, right? Looks like Norberto is having a problem logging in. Uh, Vanessa, Mena is here. Sky is here, Ashley is not here, and Corina, Corina is here. Okay, let's put a star here for Norberto for now. Okay, so that, uh, that's what I want to cover. Now we can start playing with the, with the spreadsheet, okay? We can start playing with the spreadsheet. I want, you to, I want you to do the following. Now you have everything that you need. Now you have everything that you need to fill up your spreadsheet. Okay? Everything that you need to fill up your spreadsheet. Okay, it's 1045 right now. 
And what I want you to do, fill up your spreadsheet. And fill up your spreadsheet for lab one, for lab one, and turn it in. Turn it in on, uh, it's my, you can turn it in on March 13th, okay? After the exam. And by the way, you know, it's going to be only chapters 18, 19. I'm not going to ask you for lab one yet, but I will ask for lab one in the other exam, okay? Lab one, turn it in on March 13. Lab one will not be in exam one, okay? Let's leave it. Okay, material for material for exam one. Okay, so here we go. I'm just gonna copy and paste what I had before. Okay, yeah. Roberto, okay, is coming back. Material for exam one. This one right in here. Okay. Norberto is back. And he go, I'll give attendance to Norberto. And what I want to do 1047 right now, let's take our second break, right? And what I want to do, uh, I wanted to start lab number two. Okay. Break uh, 10, let's see, 10 50 a.m. to 11 05 a.m. After the break, we start with lab two. Let's see someone here. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Any questions? So go ahead, you know, fill up your, you know, get your R square value, get your N, use the table, and don't forget, you know, fill up. Uh, I'm gonna put here material for example. I'm gonna put it right in here when uh, filling up, filling up the spreadsheet for sales. Type the values as following. As follows. Equal, I'm gonna put between quotes here, right? Equal one minus 10, right? This symbol here, in my case, should be minus four for the lower bound. And, right? And for the upper bound, like that. That's how you're supposed to type it in the uh, lower bound should be the minimum value, right? And here's the max value. You gotta do it this way to get the credit, 
Okay, I, I will be correcting that using a software that I wrote. I myself wrote. And it's 10.50 right now. We can go for a break. I see you in 15 minutes. Stop sharing. And... Okay, so I'm back here. And... How many students? We have had seven students here. That's good. And let's do the second lab now, lab number two. Okay. So what I want, like I said, what I want you to do, I want you to work, finish working on the spreadsheet of the first lab, turning in the the, work, the spreadsheet of the first lab after, right? The lab meeting. What what day did I put? The thirteenth, right? Let's take a look at the date here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 13th of March. 13th of March. You don't have to worry about the hard copy at this moment, okay? You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the hard copy of this lab report for now, okay? Eventually, I'm going to ask you that. Lab one will not be in exam one. Okay. You don't have to worry. I'm going to put that in for now. And then what I want to do, I want to start performing lab number two. And it's going to be rather similar to what you did for lab number one, but it's going to be a, a different configuration. It's going to be a different electrode configuration. Let's get the stuff here. Let's get the... Here you go. Spring 2024, PO7, uh, lab slides, lab reports, right? Raw data. Lab two. Because it's very similar to the first lab, uh, hopefully you're not gonna have much trouble doing this lab. Uh, let's see, I want right in here, Google Drive. Google Drive, my drive, 2024, group one, and then we go, that's lab number two. Lab number two for group one. Lab number two for group two. Lab number two for group three, okay? Now everybody should have it. I uploaded, uploaded the spreadsheet for lab two to your folders. Please download it to your hard drive. Download the spreadsheet. The hard drive. Okay? And let me show you how what we have. It's a different configuration. Let me show now. First, first, let me show you the configuration how it is. Right. Remember, it was uh, the configuration that we initially had. It was just two electrodes, one parallel to another one. Right. Right. That. Right like this one. Okay. Lab slides, 
this one, what we are going to have electric field two is going to be a different configuration. It's going to be something like that. I electrode in the middle and an electrode cylindrical, uh, a circle surrounding this dot here. This, this type of electrode configuration, am I sharing here? This type of electrode configuration equi is equivalent to that of a hollow cylinder. The outer circle is like a hollow cylinder and the circle in the middle is like a solid rod, cylindrical rod. That's the three-dimensional configuration of this cylinder, okay? Of this, of those two electrodes. A rod in the middle, cylindrical rod in the middle, and a cylindrical shell on the outside. And this configuration has cylindrical symmetry, okay? And how are we going to perform this experiment, right? Well, the first thing is just like we did before. Place the resistive paper or the conductive paper right on the top of the cork board to insulate it, the circuit that we're going to create. Insert four pins to the edges of the paper to secure on the cork board. Same thing that we did before. Insert one pin anywhere along the outer electrode, just like we did for the other one too, right? I can even keep on switching back and forth for you to, to see the similarities, right? Let's start all over again. You know, here you go. Here is the first experiment. Here's the second experiment. I'm going to switch, keep on switching back and forth so you can see the similarities. Resistive paper for one, resistive paper for the other, right? Here you go. Here are the electrodes for the first experiment. And here are the electrodes for the second experiment. Okay, cork board. Resistive paper on the cork board. Resistive paper on the cork board as well. Procedure is the same, right? Insert four pins at the edges, on the edges of, uh, on the edges, right? On the edges of the paper to secure it on the cork board. And we do the same here. Insert the four pins to the edges of the paper to secure on the edges, right? On the edges of the paper to secure it on the cork board. Next. Insert one pin anywhere along the outer electrode, and then we did the same. We inserted a pin on the left electrode. Oh. Left electrode. Then the pin on the other electrode, the right electrode. And then we did the same. We pin on the electrode in the middle, right? 10 power supply to set it to 10 volts. And that's exactly what we did with the other one, right? For the remainder of the experiment, 10 volts. And get black cable and connect one end to the black jack of the power supply. Okay. Connect the outer electrode to the negative of the power supply using the black cable. Okay, here I skipped one, right? I skipped on the slide, but uh, here you go. Connect the out other end of the black cable to the left electrode of the paper, right? See, negatively charged. The other one is also negatively charged, right? So going to the next one, connect the inner electrode to the positive of the battery, battery, you know, the power supply. Power supply using the red cable. And we did the same for this other one. Here you go. Negative and positive. Set an imaginary x-axis connecting the middle of the two electrodes. Do not draw. Okay. And we do something similar in the other one. Here you go. Uh, where is that? Uh, connect one now. Okay. Here you go. Here's the x-axis. But this one's going to have also a y-axis. Yeah. Both of them have a y-axis. Right? X and y-axis. X and y-axis. This one has this imaginary line you don't need in the other one. And then we go set up everything with the, you know? Set 
set up everything with the power supply and multimeter, the multimeter, right? So what we're doing here, we're just doing a checkout, checkout of the equipment, make sure everything is working, okay? As I check to your equipment, touch the red probe on the pin of the outer electrode. When what you read, you should read 10 volts. So you have one, pin, one probe of the DMM here and the other probe, the black probe of the of digital multimeter here, the red probe of the digital multimeter here. You're supposed to read 10 volts, right? Touch the red probe at several places on the surface of the outer electrode. You're supposed to read zero volts. Again, this is just a checkout, checking out the equipment, make sure everything works fine. Touch the red probe on the pin of the inner electrode, right? Touch the red probe, the surface of the inner electrode. Here should be 10 volts. Okay, oh, wait a minute. Here should be 10 volts. Here should be 10 volts. Here should be zero volts. The surface of the outer electrode, right? So it should be zero volts. And at exactly at the pin of the outer electrode. If everything works fine, we can start our experiment. So because we have 10 volts here and zero volts here, you should expect the voltage to increase from the right to the left. And we have four quadrants due to the geometry of the, of the configuration. It's gonna be slightly different how you're gonna get the data points, okay? It's gonna be slightly different. So the first thing that you do, you're going to hunt down the points that have half volt. Okay, half volt and it may vary from spreadsheet to spreadsheet, but take a look here. I start with half volt, one volt, two volts, three volts, right? Four and 5.5. That's how I start. Okay. And that's how we set up the experiment. Half volt, then next is going to be one volt along the axis, two volts, three volts, four volts, and five and a half volts. Okay. We collect the points along the x axis. Now we are going to collect the points along the y axis. Make things make for an easier procedure, a cleaner plus procedure as well. Okay, here you go. Y axis, half volt, one volt, two volt, three volt, four volt, five and a half volts. We're gonna get six data points for each equipotential that we're we are working on. Okay, and here you go. And now that we got. Uh, all the points along the x-axis and y-axis, we're gonna get the points in between here. You should, because of the geometry of the problem, you should expect equipotentials that are circular, that are circular, okay? And now notice that at half volt, we have the largest arc lengths. As we move, Towards the center, the arc length becomes shorter and shorter, right? Because the arc length becomes shorter and shorter, it might be difficult to get uh, four additional points here in between. So what we do, we start to move on into the second quadrant. This is the first, second, third, and fourth quadrant, okay? And that's what you're gonna do, here you go. Oh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Next one is, well, I don't know what, what's that here. Uh, other, let's see. Yeah, do, oh yeah, what I'm saying here, well, it doesn't apply to you, okay? Well, what I'm saying here is that when, if you're doing the actual experiment, do not get the points too close to each other, okay? Like you, you see, bunched up here. Do not get, that, that's what I'm telling you. It, it doesn't apply to you because you already have the data points there, okay? And then here you go, here's the second arc. I managed to fit the second arc in the first quadrant only. But the third arc, you know, see, I start, I need to invade the second quadrant, right? 
otherwise it becomes too close. And that's why I did four, two votes, uh, three votes, four votes, five votes and a half. That's what you should get. And, you know, and here you go. I'm gonna show you how we do something similar, how you're gonna plot the graph, plotting the graph. First thing, you no? Know? Plotting the first graph. Plotting the first graph. Of equipotential curves, equipotential curves. Plot, not plotting, let's see, plot the first graph of equipotential curves. This one here. X and Y, right? Insert should be this one. Here you go. See here the arc, the first arc. Yeah, it looks like a circular arc, right? Then, you know, right click. Let me see how do we do that. Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. Wow. And now I have to add, right? Help me out here, folks. Let's see. This one add. Uh, yes, is add. Hopefully, this one is going to be what uh, one volt and a half, one point five volts. No, it's one volt. That's what happens when we do not know Cyrillic, right? Here you go X, and then we gotta get rid of this funny number Y. One volt, and then here you go. We have our second arc. One, two, three, four, five, six. The second arc invades the second quadrant. The first arc doesn't invade the, se the second quadrant. Just like before, right click. Is that the one? I hope so. Yeah, that's the one. This one I want to edit. Let's see if I can edit this one here. Yeah, that should be 0 0.5 volts. Right, okay, good. We're gonna add another one. How many votes is gonna be the next one? Two votes. Two votes. X axis. Y axis. And then we have our third. We have our third arc. One, two, three, four, five, six again. Okay. I don't think that I don't think that they did a good job here. The group of students who collected there, I don't think they did a good job because there is a big gap between those two points. See this pair of points and this other pair of points. There was no need to invade the second quadrant, but they did anyway. And then we are going to get the other one. Then the next one is three votes. Add three votes. Three votes. Oops. Three point. Ah, it's not doing it. I don't know why. Three point zero votes. X axis. This one, Y axis, this one. Are you doing that? Everybody, are you doing that? Okay, and we're gonna add another one. Uh, doesn't let me do it, let's see. Uh, okay, it does. Four votes. Next is four votes. X axis. Notice that we have another column here. This other column is the R column. Is the distance from the center of the electrode, right? And finally, the 5.5 volts. 5.5 volts. X. Y. Right? Let's take a look. Look how it looks like. 
It has the cylindrical geometry, right? And that, that was supposed to see. So those are the equipotential curves. Curves of same potential. Okay, and then we are done. Here we go. We're done here. One more thing that you have to do that uh, I believe I mentioned to you or not. Let me see if I mentioned to you. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, I did mention. Don't forget to do the, not just the equipotential lines, but also the electric field lines, right? Once you, okay, so here you go. Once you have this equipotential lines plotted, what you're going to do? You're going to hand draw, hand draw the equipotential lines and the lines of electric field. Electric field lines go just put the three lines of electric field, no more than that. The lines of electric field must be normal to those equipotential lines, right? Gotta do that by hand. Okay. And that the first that's the first thing that you have to do. Okay, plot, actually it's plot first graph. Let's see, plot the first graph. Equipotential curves. Potential curves. Right? Okay, and draw. And then P potential curve for each equipotential, right? Then hand draw three electric field lines, electric field lines, okay? The field lines points from the positive to the negative uh, in the direction uh, in the direction of decreasing potential. That's why we have that relationship, right? Delta V over delta, in this case, should be delta R. Tumble. Delta V over delta R. And don't forget what's missing here. The negative sign is missing. Because we have a negative sign, the electric field points from the region of higher potential to the region of lower potential, okay? What else do you have to do? What else do we have? We have a second graph to plot. We have a second graph. Note, see, again, I have the R here, right? R is the distance. What's R? R is the distance from the center to the equipotential. In my specific case, you can see that the R distance is almost the same for every point in the given equipotential line, it goes from point 0 0.058 to point 0 0.061. R is in red, so you don't have to worry about significant digits there, right? See, this other one is a low, is a higher potential, is closer to the center, so is, you know, it is, has variations between point 0.047 to point 0 0.052 meters which is which is 4.7 centimeters to 5.2 centimeters as you get as you, the potential becomes higher and higher the radius decrease see that decrease right and decrease right and then what do you do next we have one two three four five and six equipotentials 
Okay? So we are going to have, uh, we were doing the same, something similar to what we did before. We are taking the average of the voltage here, right? And we log in the average voltage here. We take the average voltage of this set of data and we plug it in here. Don't forget we put our corresponding radius as well, okay? This guy, you know, is the average of those data points, right? This is the average of the other data points and so on. And then what are we going to do next? Second graph. There's a second graph, just like before. Plot a second graph, right? V average versus R. Should be our average as well. Like that. Plot a second, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. V average, R average. Yes. The bar that you see here means average. Okay. And then we're going to insert another graph. And then you got to put the, we have to put the, is that the one here? Oh boy. Now I have to, let's see, is that the one here? Okay, that's the one. Okay. Don't forget this is really case in Russian. I don't understand any of that. Okay, one is going to be what? This one is linear, right? This one is what? I believe this one is should be exponential. Can you confirm that with me? The very first one at the top. And most likely this one here is logarithmic. I presume. Let's see. Yeah, it's log. Yeah, that's right. So you want to plot. You want to fit a logarithmic curve. A logarithmic curve, okay? For this one, uh, plot a, let's, let's see here. And the other one should be, a, I believe, a power. Oh, yeah, the other one is going to be a power. Yes, power and log. You're going to, in this case, in this case, you're going to plot a second graph, A. In this case, you will have two um, regression equations. Equations. One. One power. One power fit. The other, a log fit. Already plot the power fit there. Make sure you display both of them. Uh, this one here. Yeah, this one. What you want is the power fit. I believe is this one here, maybe. Yeah, that's the power fit. Okay. Power fit, yeah. Each different Each different uh, fit will have uh, different R square values. But the log has a better R square, closer to one. See that? 0. 0.9961. That's a better one. It means that uh, the log regression equation is, is the best fit compared to the power to the power one. Let me see one thing here. Did you do that? We're not doing linear linear regressions in this case, okay? We're doing instead power and log fits. So I want to know how you're doing there. I'm going to bother you a little bit.
on. Okay, good. Is that me? You already know what you do, right? That you have to do here. The other ones, okay. Skies coming. Let's see. Let's take a look here at the, how you're doing. 1138. Here, okay. Five. Uh, graphs. Okay, Jacqueline, did you manage to plot your graphs? Two graphs to plot. That's the first. Task. Are you there, Jacqueline? Yes? Okay, good. And Jacqueline managed to do that. Who's next? Your goal. Your goal is not here, right? I don't see your goal here. Next is Lizelle. Hi, Lizelle. Okay, good. You plotted. That's great. Any questions, Lizelle? Do you have any questions? No? Okay, good. Paul Zapata, did you manage to plot your graphs, Paul? Yes, I did. Okay, good. No problem, right? Vanessa Escalera. Vanessa is not here, right? The other Vanessa is here. Norberto. Did you plot your graph, Norberto? Good. Vanessa Mena. Did you plot your graph, Vanessa? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Sky? Yes. Okay, Ashley is not here. And Corina, did you manage to plot, plot your graph, Corina? Yes. Okay, no problem, right? So Excel has this this feature, right? It's not they, they, Excel does has a you know the feature to determine the regression equation for a linear fit. Yeah, most graphs are. Most graphs that we get in the lab, we, we get a linear fit, but every now and then we come along graphs that requires fits that are other, right? That's different than the linear one. And Excel provides us with this facility. Okay. So next, what we are going to do next, just like before, the same, uh, The same script, right? Next, fill in the fill in the units. Okay. I'm not gonna tell you what the units because I already did that for the first lab, right? You should be able to know that. Okay, X, Y, and R votes X, Y, and R votes X, Y, and R, right? Here's R average, V average, sigma, you already know what's the equation for the sigma, right? Uh, it is the, the sigma of the R in this case, the sigma of the R, the, okay. And then you have this other sigma, you have the sigma R over R. And don't forget, right, to, Well, we're, we're gonna get there and don't forget to put it here, the units. There is no units here. Let me see. And there's nothing more here that we have to worry about, right? For the units. What else? Next, filling the units. Uh, display the significant figures. Significant figures, okay? For X and Y, X and Y, the resolution has to be what? X, 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 X meter. Okay, here you go. For V, for X and Y, you display the measurements. As, right? Oh, you meters. 
for voltage, you use the table on six phase. I go, where is the table for six figs? Uh, I close it. Let's see if I can get it back. Yeah, right here. Voltage, DMM, right? Depending on the value of the voltage, you use this table here. And what else? Find CL using the CL table. Okay. So that's what we have for this lab report. What we can do, so let's see here. Since well, we managed to finish, right? We managed to finish this lab report. It's very similar to the previous one. So let's uh, set uh, for you to turn in lab report two the same day as you turn report lab report one. It's not gonna be the complete thing, but uh, just the spreadsheet. So turning the spreadsheet. So let's write it down here. Well, where did I write it down? Three, let's see, 313, right? Ah, okay, here. Okay, let's get ahead of ourselves, okay? Fill up the spreadsheets, okay? Four labs, one and two, and turn them Turn them on March 13, 24. You don't have to worry about the hard copy of these labs, right? This lab reports. For now, labs one and two will not be in exam one. Let's do this way. Just a spreadsheet for now. Good night. No, later on I tell you how to do the the hard copy. Yeah, so we managed to finish that. I didn't expect we were gonna do that. But that's because we didn't lecture, right? We didn't lecture on the material. We just did lab from the beginning to the end. Any questions? Any more questions? It's uh, 11.45 right now. Let's see if you can go through each student again. And seven students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. We can now we can finish a little bit earlier today. Okay. And I have a I have office hours now. I have office hours until 12.45 today, 12.45 p.m., okay? If you don't have any questions, so you can finish it now and we'll meet again on Monday. And we get into the chapters on the electric circuit, okay? So I'll see you on Monday.